So, good morning to everybody, uh, or good afternoon, depending on your time sign. It's a very sunny and springly weather in Finland. And uh, here I'm very happy to warmly welcome you to this webinar offered by Hankia Finnish Feed Innovations. My name is Jyrki Heinimo, and uh, I'm the Export Director at Hankia. Our topic today, from optimized intestinal functions to excellent performance of poultry, offers us really interesting insights on new innovations affecting the absorption of nutrients in broilers. We will now hear more about the subject from our esteemed speakers, Professor Richard Ducatel from Ghent University in Belgium, and from Dr. Juha Apajalahti from company Alimetrix in Finland. I will now give the word to our R&D director, Juhani Vorenma, who will act as the moderator on this webinar. Please go ahead, Johanny. Yeah, hello to everybody and welcome to the webinar also on my behalf. Uh, we all wish poultry to be healthy and perform well and smoothly functioning intestine is crucial for that. It has been an important topic for Hankia's research and development and we are very grateful of having two excellent speakers discussing this topic today. Uh, in his talk, Professor Ducatel will focus on the role of small intestine in absorption of nutrients and how this is disturbed by inflammation due to variety of causes. For his part, Dr. Apajalahti will talk about different research approaches for studying intestinal health and the mode of action of feed additives. We have reserved some time for discussion after the presentations and you can write your questions during the webinar in the question box which you can find uh, uh, from the right top corner of your screen. If there will be more questions than we can handle within the limited time, we try to answer uh, you later by email. Now, I would like to introduce you our first speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Ducatel has been a professor in veterinary pathology at uh, Gent University since 1989 and been a member of the board of directors of the university. His main research field is intestinal pathology and health with a focus on poultry and pigs. As well as being an author or, or co-author of more than 650 scientific publications, he has publications. He has been an invited speaker at more than 80 national and international congresses. Richard, uh, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try, I'll try and share uh, <clears throat> I'll try and share my screen and as, as soon as we get through all the technical hustle, um, I want to start my presentation uh, by first of all, Mr. Chairman, I think we, we should we should sit back and just have a little thought about about where do we come from and, and why is there so much interest in, in intestinal health, in especially, especially in, in chickens and, and even more so in broilers? Well, the, the simple reason, of course, is that this, this animal has been, has been selected for over 50 years uh, and even longer than that, uh, it's almost 100 years now that there has been selection towards towards uh, breast yields, but even more so towards daily weight gain. And as you can see here, uh, these, these figures are really impressive. And, and we should realize that there is 
year after year, there's still progress being made in, in this way. And of course, you, you cannot get this, this uh, tremendous, tremendous um, um, daily weight gain. You can only get it by, by uh, selecting these animals for, for feed intake. And indeed, this is, this is an old slide, but, but even so, um, you, can, you can see that these, these animals, they, they eat huge amounts. And, and that puts a lot of pressure that puts a lot of pressure on the gastrointestinal tract and on the digestive uh, system as a whole. And, and that's, uh, uh, of course, that's the reason why there's, there's so much interest in, in intestinal health nowadays, because this, this organ system is under pressure. And, and of course, we, uh, we, should, uh, we should realize that um, um, uh, these, uh, these nutrients that are taken up, we all know from our... our um, nutrition courses that absorption of the nutrients is taking place in the small intestine. And we should realize that in, in the chicken and, and in birds in general, it's especially focused on the duodenum. So the duodenum is actually the part of the intestine where most of the absorption of nutrients takes place. And this is actually through an active transcellular transport mechanism. I will uh, try and um, find my pointer, that will help. Uh, you see the yellow triangles here, they symbolize um, uh, a, lot, a lot of different receptors um, because there are receptors expressed, these are transcellular uh, proteins uh, which bind um, all the nutrients that are required for, for the animal are, are bound by rece receptors taken up into the epithelial cell and passed into the lymph vessels or into the bloodstream. So, so that's the way uh, absorption of nutrients take, takes place. It's an active receptor-mediated transcellular transport. And this is the case for, for any nutrient, you name it, any amino acid is the case for, is the case for lipids, is the case for trace elements, it's the case for any nutrient that is required for the daily weight gain and the maintenance of the animal. Um, and of course, we should realize that um, uh, this system is under stress, not only because of the massive feed intake of the birds, but also because of environmental uh, factors that may have a negative influence on, on the whole system. And one of these environmental factors that is, uh, that is uh, becoming very, very uh, hot topic nowadays, uh, Maybe not so much in Finland, but even in, in Belgium and, and large parts of Europe nowadays, heat stress is becoming an issue in the summer. Um, and, and we can see that this is this may be an effect, of course, of, uh, of the climate change. But the, the consequence of that is that uh, um, heat stress is associated with an increased intestinal permeability. And in the old days, people would have said, oh, the intestine must be permeable. Not so. We know now that the intestinal permeability is, is a, 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 a harmful consequence because the permeability is due to a deficiency of the tight junctions in between the epithelial cells. And you can, um, you can uh, easily imagine that if the absorption of the nutrients should be through mm -hmm. the transcellular pathway, when there's a leak in the tight junctions between the epithelial cells, it's like um, the windmills in Holland that need to pump the water and the water is running back the other side. So that doesn't work like that. So leakage um, or increased intestinal permeability, for instance, due to heat stress, is a very, very harmful event and, and disadvantages to the function of the, of the nutrients, uh, of, the, uh, of the intestine and the absorption of the nutrients. So this damage or this leakage of the tight junctions due to heat stress it also triggers a vicious circle. I'm not going to go into detail here, but this is just a vicious circle of, of immunological and inflammatory response, which makes it get worse and worse. So, um, so this, this is what it's all about. And that's why there's so many issues with intestinal health nowadays in, in the broilers because of the, um, the impact of, um, of any environmental factors, but also because of the massive feed intake on a, um, 
a response, which is an inflammatory response. And this is uh, even better illustrated here. On the left side, you have the, uh, the cartoon of the optimal intestinal health. And on the right side, this is what you get when there's leakage. There is gaps between the epithelial cells, which means that there are components of the host leaking into the intestinal lumen, and that, that's what causes wet litter. And there are compounds and also microbes that come from the intestinal lumen that, that can leak into the system. And this triggers an inflammatory response. And that we should realize that there is also always a certain level of inflammation in the intestinal tract, especially so in broilers. And this inflammation is associated with morphological changes in the gut tissues. So the consequence is also, of course, that there will be translocation of the bacteria. And these bacteria can end up in the joints. And that's why we see nowadays, nowadays so many cases of lameness and of um, even paralysis in, in, the, in the broilers. And of course, this, um, this inflammation in the intestinal tract, it is best illustrated, I think, by this macroscopic uh, lesion scoring system, which Martin de Gussem, and many of you uh, have heard about Martin de Gussem, probably he is advertising this all over the world. And when you look at this uh, scoring system, which was originally published by Emma Terling in, already in 2012, you can see that it is based on, on, on characteristics of inflammation and poor digestion. That's the characteristics. And this foamy aspect with the air bubbles here, they indicate the dysbiosis, so the, uh, the production of gas by um, harmful, harmful microorganisms. So this whole gross lesion scoring system, the dysbiosis scoring system, is actually based, essentially based on, on the inflammation in the small intestine. So this is really the key of what is going on. So in the next slide, if it wants to go to the next slide, yes, that's what I should do. So in the next slide, I also want to emphasize that we all know that coccidiosis is everywhere and you cannot raise a broiler without it being in contact with Aemeria, uh, or be it Aemeria isavirlina or Maxima or Tinella. These are the three most important ones in broilers. What these protozoal parasites do uh, is they infect epithelial cells and at each step of their infection cycle they kill an epithelial cell so this they destroy an epithelial cell at each step of their replication cycle so coccidiosis is also a major cause of um, you know um, disturbances in this system because when there is an epithelial cell missing of course you have massive leakage inside out and outside in and as a consequence you have massive inflammation and what you can see in this scanning electron micrographs which i took many years ago when you take away the mucus and you look at the at the uh, the small intestinal villi this is how they uh, should look like in in the perfect world and this is how they look like when there is damage to the epithelium so what you get is there is the, um, the propria mucosa. So the tissue underneath is, is naked and it's, it's, it's um, actually it's inflamed. And it is now well established, and this is a very recent paper uh, because in, in the human literature nowadays, there is a, a lot of interest in, in, in actually the, the role of what is called metalloproteinases in inflammation in the intestine. And it's considered that this is a key in uh, the human uh, syndrome of inflammatory bowel disease. And we know that this is an important uh, problem of, in, in the human uh, medical world. These metalloproteinases play, uh, apparently play an essential role in the development of, of the lesions. And so what, what does that actually mean? Well, when we have, uh, you know, damaged epithelial cells as opposed to healthy epithelial cells, and, and you look at these metallo matrix metalloproteinases, what do they do? Well, matrix metalloproteinases are present everywhere in the tissues, especially, especially underneath the epithelium in the, in the intestine, but normally they are inhibited, so they cannot break down the, the proteins, uh, these metalloproteinases, they cannot break down the tissue because they are inhibited by, by other protein, other proteins uh, which are present also in the interstitium, and these are the inhibitors, tissue inhibitors of the matrix metalloproteinases. So normally this is kept in balance. 
But what happens when there's inflammation? When there's inflammation, there is actually an increase in the matrix metalloproteinases, so in these triangles, and there's a reduction in the inhibitors, which means that the matrix metalloproteinases, which are produced by the cells, they start breaking down the tissue. And this breaking down of the tissue makes the inflammation worse and damage the tissue even more. And so, um, so we recently looked at this in, um, in the intestine of, uh, of broiled chickens. And we found out that resin acids are capable of inhibiting this metalloproteinase damaging activity uh, in, in the small intestine. And these resin acids, of course, they come from pine trees, as we all know. And they're the, more, the essential uh, active component, the most important active component is abiotic acid and its derivatives. It's a diterpenoid. And this, um, this, um, uh, this ab abiotic acid has been shown to have anti-inflammatory, known anti-inflammatory uh, activity, which is uh, well known in the human medical world. Uh, so, but when you add these uh, uh, these resin acids uh, to uh, to the feed of broilers at at only 270 ppm, and you look at the um, uh, matrix metalloproteinase activity in the tissues in the proprio mucosae of the small intestine, here we looked at their uh, gelatin uh, break uh, breakdown activity, their breakdown activity towards collagen one and towards collagen four. And you can see that when the resin acids are present in the feed, there's less breakdown of the matrix collagens, which make up the strength of the tissue. Um, and, and you see it with both collagen type 1 and collagen type 4. There's a reduction in the enzymes that break down the tissue and that are so um, responsible for the vicious circle of intestinal inflammation. And we took this one step further and we did a zymographical uh, analysis. I will not go into detail about the, the technical aspect of this uh, zymography, but it, it comes down to, to looking at uh, you know, the molecular weight of the different uh, collagen-destroying uh, matrix metalloproteinases. And as you can see here, there's a clear inhibition in the collagen destruction at these levels of molecular weight. And these levels of molecular weight are actually where uh, the matrix metalloproteinase 7 uh, should be because it has uh, the mature matrix metalloproteinase 7 is a, a molecular weight of 18 kilodalton, so that's this one, and the pre forms are, are the ones that are over here. So we you can see that the um, uh, resin acids, when they are uh, the more they are purified, the more they are active against the matrix metalloproteinase 7 at the level of. You know, functional level, we measured it at the functional level, but we also looked at it at gene expression level, and you can see that um, there is a reduction in the matrix metalloproteinase 7 activity. And this matrix metalloproteinase 7 is known in, in, the, you know, in fundamental research studies, it's known to be involved uh, you know, in, in um, uh, inhibiting wound, uh, wound healing. And in order to evaluate this, we checked this in vitro, so we did a standardized um, cell culture, which we uh, we made a, cra a, a scratch on this cell culture, a standardized scratch where we take away the cells. You can see the cells over here and the cells over here. Here they are taken away by a scratch, and, and uh, we tested it in the presence of the uh, resin acids, and you can see that the healing uh, by migration of the epithelial cells is much better. So there's the, the uh, defect uh, where the epithelial cells were taken away. The defect is becoming smaller much more rapidly in the, um, in the um, uh, uh, treatment as compared to the control. And so that indicates indeed that the resin acids promote um, cell migration. So taking this together, um, uh, all of this indicates that uh, we should realize that absorption of nutrients, it takes place in the small intestine. It's a receptor mediated process, which is transcellular. So the nutrients pass through the epithelial cell. Uh, we should realize that 
Uh, this system only works well when there's nothing leaking in between the cells. So when the tight junctions in between the, the cells are firmly closed, and it's clear, it has been demonstrated many times that heat stress um, makes the tight junctions weaker so that there is leakage of this barrier system. Uh, and the same holds true for coccidiosis. So these three, two um, are actually the, uh, some of the main challenges uh, which broilers are facing uh, nowadays. And of course, um, we should all realize that when there's barrier leakage, this is associated with inflammation, and this inflammation um, leads to an increased expression of matrix metalloproteinases, and these matrix metalloproteinases, they destroy the, the collagen which make up the stability of the intestinal tissue, so it creates more damage, more inflammation, so that is the vicious circle. And of course, um, now we know that there are indeed tools available that can interrupt this vicious circle, and we believe that this is important for poultry production in general. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for interesting, excellent presentation. Uh, I haven't seen any, any questions in the questions box yet, but I can start, uh, start the questions myself. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that, that uh, feed intake, uh, how the feed intake of the birds has increased uh, due to genetic uh, selection. So, um, and, and that, that um, environmental factors like uh, heat stress or coccidiosis uh, can cause these um, inflammatory responses. Uh, but um, can high feed intake by itself cause inflammatory responses without uh, any environmental factors? That's in the, indeed a, an excellent question. Um, high feed intake, um, um, it, to, well, it depends on um, the feed formula. If this high feed intake is with a, a high density feed, then you can imagine that this can lead to a condition where the, um, you know, the enzymatic and metabolic functions of the of the intestine and of the of the stomach of the the proventriculus um, are you know overruled so that the the system is is not capable of absorbing all of the nutrients in the small intestine, and that's one of the big big issues nowadays. In um, in South America, they even call it feed passage syndrome. And it has been estimated that up to 10% of the nutrients that are taken up by the broiler pass into the feces. Now, as such, that is an issue. But of course, the most important consequence of that is that there are digestible components that pass into the cica. And, and as they pass into the cica, they become available for the micro, the huge microbiome which is there, which contains up to log 11 microbes per gram. And that is actually um, a very advantageous situation for the, uh, the um, uh, phylum of the proteobacteria, uh, especially the family of the Enterobacteria CI, which contains germs which we know very well, of course, like E. coli and Salmonella. And it doesn't necessarily lead to a pathological condition with pathogens that start multiplying. But even in the case that it's just, you know, ordinary, not very pathogenic E. coli that start multiplying, what they produce is a lot of hydrogen sulfide. And um, actually, there seems to be a a balance between um, the proteobacteria and the um, butyrate-producing ruminococcus CI and lachnospira CI within the phylum of the firmicutes. 
And so what you get in, in, under these conditions is a shift away from the butyrate producers towards the hydrogen sulfide producers. And, uh, and that is, a, that is a, a major problem because um, uh, there, will, there will be less butyrate produced in the Sika. There will be more hydrogen sulfide produced in, in the Sika. And the hydrogen sulfide causes damage to the epithelium. And the butyrate uh, is insufficient to stimulate the, the production of GLP-2, glucagon-like peptide 2, by the L cells. And so in this way, you have a, a, a condition which leads to um, insufficient production of GLP-2 and also GLP-1. And that, amongst others, is um, um, disadvantages for the um, stability and the replication of the epithelial cells in the small intestine. So you have a, a harmful effect both on the large, in, uh, both on the Sika and on the small intestine. And that leads to um, you know, more, uh, animals being more susceptible to intestinal damage. So even without heat stress and without coccidiosis, you, there's still an issue when the animals are overfeeding. Thank you very much for a good comprehensive um, answer to this question. I, I, there are some questions now in the questions box. I, I start from the first one. Uh, does the reduction of MMP7 by resin acids only take place in the intestine, kind of local reaction, or, or can a reduction also be expected in the rest of the body? That's a, an excellent question. Um, we didn't do any research specifically on this, and, and maybe um, uh, the next speaker can say something more about that. Um, uh, we we have uh, essentially focused on the uh, on the local infect in the intestine, um, and and there we uh, uh, we have seen this uh, this effect. Uh, we have clearly shown the effect. Whether it's it's also uh, well, I, um, I I think I'd better leave the rest of the answer to the other speaker. Don't you think so? Mm -hmm. uh, then another question. One question still, um, are the resin as it's absorbed? I think that Juha will handle that uh, in his presentation because then uh, then the uh, there is a question that if not, how can it interact with metalloproteinases inside the collagen tissues? Oh, oh. if we look at, if we look locally in the intestine, of course, uh, it's even not a matter of absorption because when there's damage to the epithelium, you get uh, you simply get diffusion in between the epithelial cells, and that obviously is sufficient because we could clearly show that the uh, that the collagenase activity in the tissue of the small intestine is reduced. Uh, thank you. There are still some more questions in the questions box, but maybe uh, we continue uh, um, and, and then uh, answer the questions later. Uh, so I thank you very much, Richard, in this phase. And now I would like to introduce you uh, our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Juha Apajalahti is founder and CEO of an independent research company, Alimetrics. Previously, he was research director in Kultur Danisko and in charge of the research uh, for groups, business units, uh, such as uh, FinFeeds and Suomen Rehu Hankia, uh, developing health promoting food and feed ingredients. The scientific background of uh, Dr. Apajalahti is in intestinal health and microbiology, and he has published over 100 scientific papers, book chapters, and invited conference papers. Juha, please, the screen is yours. Thank you, Juhani. I hope you can hear me well, and I hope I can uh 
start my presentation. Something is happening. Some processing. Okay. I think now it works. Yes, it does. Okay. All right. Thank you, Johanny, for the for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here. It's always a pleasure to share share my views. Uh, the topic here today is, is uh, something about mode of action studies and, and I will be showing also some, some examples. Uh, firstly, you know, I would be talking about uh, mode of action studies in general and why should we be doing mode of action uh, studies and then some case studies. So this uh, first question here is why to study mode of action is something that we quite often hear because uh, let's say there may be some feed additives that work well and, and you get uh, improved animal performance and, and uh, get body weight gain and FCER. So you may hear a question that uh, why should you know what the mode of action is if the product works? And uh, I will be giving some, uh, some reasons, you know, why to study mode of action. Of course, for for a scientist, you know, the, the scientific curiosity is, is a good enough reason, but uh, that's not good enough reason for for industrial companies. So, uh, for companies, of course, it's important to be seen as a, as a company with high scientific profile and published papers and so on. And uh, in addition to this. It's also very valuable that you can you can actually gain knowledge of the product and how it works because it helps you in in developing next generation products. And therefore, it's it's very important for product registration. It it helps if you know how the product works also, and you can show something about the product safety to consumers and and so on. Also. If the product doesn't work for some reason, you know, you don't get better animal performance. If you know how the product works, it may also help you in, in troubleshooting and trying to understand why the product this time did not work. And of course, it's very important for, for marketing and, and product differentiation of the company because it's it's very difficult to sell a product that you know nothing about that is, that is like a black box we have seen this in in our research very well because we are we are serving companies and during the last 10 years we have seen with the more than 100 client companies that uh, that there's clear trend here companies really require more mode of action and uh, data they need them for technical dossiers and uh, and uh, many many other things for product registration they want to be able to explain their clients how the product works and uh, this helps in marketing you you get you know market uh, stories and and uh, papers brochures and there's a clear trend that there are few animal trials run maybe today, but uh, more and more information will be extracted from each of them. It's uh, obvious still, you know, that this kind of feeding and weighing study is highly important because, because of course, the product has to work and animal has to grow better or feed conversion efficiency must be better. But that's not enough 
nowadays you you need to be able to explain why the product works like it does but uh, of course worth understanding that that the improved growth and performance is is the one that uh, pays the premium of the product and 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 therefore it has to also work well uh, then I thought I would be explaining a little bit, you know, what kind of experimental approaches are commonly used and what kind of approaches we are using for mode of action studies. So perhaps the most, most common way is that when you are running an animal trial, you take a lot of samples from the animals. And uh, from those samples, you can analyze many different things, microbiological, immunological, and physiological parameters. You can sample blood or tissues if, you, if uh, that is relevant for your feed additive. And then you are analyzing important parameters from these, these uh, samples. But there is one problem here in this kind of approach that uh, but you only get a kind of snapshot. In the gastrointestinal tract, there are many simultaneous processes ongoing. And, uh, and uh, when you take a sample and you analyze something there, you, you don't really see the kinetics of the situation. It's a snapshot. For example, one can say that the, the bacterium can be producing something and the animal epithelium is taking up the product at the same time. So by analyzing some component from the gastrointestinal tract, you don't really know what is the rate of production of that compound by bacteria. Or vice versa, the host animal can be secreting something to the lumen of the intestine and microbes can be degrading it. So by analyzing the concentration in the lumen, you don't really know what is the rate of secretion of a, of a product by the host. So with this kind of approach, you can really reveal very important analytes and, and what it is worth analyzing. But the, the kinetics part is kind of vague. You, know, you, you cannot really tell what is the kinetics. Then uh, there is a way, you know, to to study kinetics also, and 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 one of the things that uh, we also commonly use is is that we kind of combined in the animal trials is kind of uh, various ex vivo approaches. So what this means is that uh, uh, that uh, you can actually a little bit simplify the system. For example, you can uncouple the, the part of the microbial community from the uptake of nutrients. So you kind of make the system more simple. And therefore, you can, you can study these partial processes alone without involvement of the, of the, of the other, other process. And that makes it possible for you to also evaluate the kinetics of reactions and uh, I would say that this is really vital for that purpose especially if you really want to understand what is the mode of action of something even you know a little bit more complex complex uh, process you really have to use many different approaches to be able to reveal what the mode of action is in our laboratory, we like to divide this kind of mode of action studies and, and the models in, in three different classes. Firstly, we have this kind of in vitro. And, and when we are talking about in vitro, it really means in the class. And uh, it means that you have totally artificial system where you do the studies. And it's totally outside the biological content the context of the animal uh, and still it's very important if you would like to answer very simple questions like uh, for example 
are resin acids inhibiting the growth of Clostridium perfringens. You can do that in very, very simple system and, uh, and you get answer to your question. But if you want to mimic a little bit more what really happens in the gastrointestinal tract, then uh, we use something we call ex vivo approaches. And uh, ex vivo means out of the living, and, and uh, it was originally used for studies where live tissues have been taken from the live animal, or maybe it's animal is sacrificed first, but uh, you take a tissue and the tissue continues to live and all the reactions there keep active for a while typically quite a short while but still it enables you to study reactions in the laboratory and but the system mimics very well those in the gastrointestinal tract we use this approach very often for for studies with microbial communities. So we take entire mi microbial communities from certain part of the gastrointestinal tract and <clears throat> study what they do in the laboratory and how, for example, different kind of compounds affect the total microbial community and, and its functions. So the good thing here is that it, uh, it really mimics well the true authentic system. And it takes into account also this kind of really complex microbial interactions. And then, of course, finally, we have in vivo studies, which are with live animals. And, and uh, of course, you eventually need those for, for studying the productivity, for example, and effects on performance and health. But also, as part of the mode of action studies, it's really important. So this is kind of a platform that uh, we commonly use in, in our laboratory when we are running projects for our clients. Okay, so much about the, the approaches as such. <clears throat> Then I thought I would take a case study here, you know, and uh, since we are in Hankia seminar now, I will take an example as uh, our studies with a product called Progress. <clears throat> and uh, Progress contains mainly this kind of uh, tal oil fatty acids, as you, many of you know. Firstly, you know, what kind of, how, how does that differ from other dietary fats? It's, uh, it's, it's actually very different. The fat part of the product contains much more unsaturated fatty acids and, and uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And uh, another very important part is that it contains resin acids also a little bit less than 10 percent and resin acids are really different from from fatty acids and they can be very potent uh, potent uh, effectors in in many biological reactions <clears throat> so with this kind of product we have uh, run some animal trials with broiler chickens and uh, and i know that uh, hankia has run even much more animal trials elsewhere. And it seems to be really effective compound. It, it really increases body weight gain nicely. And uh, body weight gain is increased and, and feed conversion ratio is also improved, which is, uh, which is of course a good starting point for a product. So in the other animal trial also with similar results. So clearly improved body weight gain and, and uh, improved FCR, which is a good thing. But then the question is that why? What is, what is happening? Why is this product doing this? And that's of course, very relevant question. So uh, we were firstly, you know, asked to study 
whether this compound would affect intestinal bacteria. And uh, we studied many common intestinal bacteria of broiler chickens, both pathogens and commensal bacteria like uh, lactobacilli. And in this kind of studies in vitro, in simple, you know, laboratory environment, we saw that uh, Clostridium perfringens was very effectively inhibited by this progress product. And also at very low concentration, which uh, is, was kind of astonishing because, uh, because we are talking about concentrations that are typical or even lower than what the antibiotics are often used. <clears throat> the good thing is that uh, that this kind of commensal bacteria, like uh, uh, we have here three different lactobacilli, Crispatus ruteri and salivarius, which are the most common ones in broiler chickens. They were totally unaffected by this product. So they were much more tolerant than Clostridium perfringens. And, that is always all, always a good thing. So if your, let's say, good or commensal bacteria would be much more susceptible to a compound than, than the pathogenic ones, then the situation would not be very good. Then we analyzed uh, similar bacteria from broiler chicken trial and, uh, and samples from the trial in, in small intestine and and we could see there that uh, that uh, lactobacillus numbers were even somewhat increased with uh, tofa being present in the in the diet and clostridium perfringens was slightly reduced but that the reduction was not statistically significant but uh, nevertheless this is kind of consistent with the our original finding in in uh, in vitro All right, then of course the crucial question is that uh, does this finding has anything to do with this improved performance that we could detect in animals? And that's, a, that's always a very, very difficult question when you are talking about mode of action studies. That is something, if something is correlating with something, what does it really mean? It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the thing you are analyzing is actually causing the improved correlation. So in this case, in this slide, you can see that uh, that uh, when we are studying correlation between body weight of the broiler chickens and lactobacilli, for example, we can see that there's a strong, positive, statistically significant correlation. And roughly say that according to this kind of statistical approach, one third of the of the effect would could be explained by by lactobacilli. But in reality, it's very difficult to draw these kind of conclusions. Richard in the in the previous presentation was uh, showing effects on 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 these metalloproteases and and. Uh, and uh, then probably there also you would see that there's a correlation between this kind of uh, expression effects and performance. Also, we can see probably if we would be analyzing many other things, we can say that uh, many other things are also affected. But what is actually causing and what is the ultimate reason for the for the improved performance that is always the crucial question and quite difficult to answer especially when we are talking about the product like uh, tal oil fatty acids it has multiple components and and it's possible that this fatty acid compartment can have a certain kind of biological effects and then resin acids can have something else and uh, for example, this kind of unsaturated long chain fatty acids, they, they are generally, you know, probably healthy, you know, healthier than, than saturated fatty acids and, and you get better, you know, membrane fluidity and, and healthier epithelium. 
when you have uh, that kind of fatty acids present. Resin acids, on the other hand, they have specific inhibitions to certain bacteria, and you can also see that they have certain immune effects. But uh, what is exactly then causing this this effect to the animal? That's a that's a difficult thing. Of course, these are all positive effects, but this uh, effect on performance and uh, this kind of sum of all these, or is there one specific thing that we at the moment cannot really identify, which is the reason for the improved performance. One very relevant question is that what happens to components of, of uh, for example, dalol fatty acids and or, or product progress in the animal? So this kind of general long chain fatty acids, they are likely really to merge to, to, the, to the fat metabolism and anabolism of, of the host animal. So probably they are not in any concern, but what, what happens to resin acids? That's something that uh, we've been wondering because uh, these resin acids are quite difficult to degrade and, and is it so that they are enriching in animal? So we run a, run a study, you know, to, to analyze resin acids from different tissues of broiler chickens. And uh, what we firstly found was that uh, resin acids were really effectively taken up by the host, so really absorbed already from the quite upper upper intestine, upper small intestine and duodenum, and, and uh, quite rapidly. So we estimated that possibly something like 75% of re resin acids were really rapidly absorbed. But then we could see that uh, the, the turnaround in, in the liver was very rapid and, uh, and, uh, and resin acids were conjugated in the liver. This is a common me mechanism when, when the animal wants to get rid of some compound, it, uh, it makes it more water soluble so that it's easier to eliminate it from the body. And uh, from liver, this material is going to bile where it's then uh, secreted back to the small intestine in duodenum. So in bile, we could measure very high concentrations of resin acids, but then they were mainly in conjugated forms and they were secreted from there back to the small intestine. We of course analyzed these edible tissues of broiler chickens because they are very relevant for, for consumer safety. So the concentrations in, in, in chicken meat and liver, that was very, very low or even below detection limit. So that tells us that uh, there's not really any, any possibility that the human consumer would get any significant amounts of resin acids from, the, from eating broiled chicken meat or liver. We also followed the elimination of these compounds from the body and, and uh, up to 70% of all resin acids we could recover in, in feces of broiler chickens. Certain part of, of, uh, of uh, resin acids we could not find and, and, uh, and we really assume that, that they are partly metabolized by intestinal bacteria, but, but also, also most likely by, by the host issues. Uh, all right, so then that's about the example. Then a couple of, you know, take home messages, what I would like you to remember from this. Firstly, it's, it's really obvious that uh, it's more and more common to study mode of action of feed additives. Very few companies nowadays sell a product that they don't even have a you know, hypothesis how the product works. Often, uh, often they may use claims that are used by, by some other similar products and, uh, and sell them as kind of me too products. 
but uh, but it's very very common now nowadays to have your own mode of action studies and, and mechanical studies to understand how the product works then the second thing i would like you to remember is is, uh, is that uh, it's uh, not very straightforward to to study mode of action there, there are many different processes in in biological system in the host and and uh, therefore therefore you really need many different approaches to to be sure that uh, this and this is the your true mode of action you may see effects and correlations to many parameters but uh, it's much more difficult to to really know what is behind the, the, for example, improved animal performance. And this kind of uh, black box product, it's, it's really difficult for, for a reseller of, of a product. If you cannot tell anything about, you don't have a story. And that kind of product is also more difficult to register. Troubleshooting is more difficult. And it's also more difficult to develop next generation products if you don't have a clue what the what the mode of action is. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Juha, for the excellent, clear presentation. Uh, there are some questions. Uh, appearing in the in the question box um, uh, so the first question here are conjugated resin acid as present in the bio still antimicrobial do you know well that's something we we really haven't studied but uh, i would suspect that they are not as antimicrobial at least than, than the unconjugated ones but uh, that's something we haven't studied so cannot be sure okay uh, is there a possibility is there possibly an increase of uh, talor fatty acids in the fat content of chicken of sorry can of, you... of chicken uh, so that uh, if you feed uh, talor fatty acids to birds Mm. Uh, are they absorbed in the in the fat content abdominal fat skin fat of chicken i think this is yeah. refers to the fatty acids or yes yes well of course this is also something that we haven't especially studied but uh, i would assume so that you know they are used in the, in the, in fact we have studied some other let's say unsaturated fatty acids that when you, when you are feeding those to to animals you can see that there is a change in the fatty acid content of the fat of the animal so so normally this kind of dietary fatty acids they really affect the composition of fat also in the in the animal body and tissues okay good uh then another question is that uh, in the performance trials there were no significant different differences of uh, feed conversion ratio um, from zero to 35 days uh, how viable would this information be commercially for a broiler integrator because they are they ain't be looking at data from zero to three weeks only mm, yeah but of course we saw we saw numeric effects and uh, and uh, this is probably something that uh, johanny can answer better or somebody else from hankia what is relevant data <laughs> but uh, but i would say that in in this our trials normally since we are sampling a lot of animals from the pens in all pens we are taking sampling animals for this kind of analysis it really affects the, the data so that the, the statistics is getting a little bit more difficult when you have less animals and, and you are disturbing the animals 
but uh, maybe somebody from Hankia can better answer, you know, what kind of data is valuable for, for selling the product. Improved end weight at 35 days is also valid. Mm. Not only FCR. Um, okay, then there has been some questions, um, mainly to Richard, I think. Uh, one is that, um, wait a moment, I wrote it down here. Uh, can resin as its help in reducing PCO lameness, which is an emerging problem in, in, in the poultry industry? Yes, it's a, of course, it's an, a burning question because um, this is an important issue in the broiler production. A um, lot of birds that are lame and that develop uh, arthritis, osteoarthritis, and uh, chondroosteoarthritis also. Um, we have not specifically investigated this because that requires um, a different setup and, and specific experimental uh, models to be used. Um, what we can infer from our studies is that um, uh, taking into account that there is an effect on the um, uh, barrier and the intestinal barrier is actually um, essential for the development of um, bacterial chondro necrosis and osteoarthritis. Um, um, I'm speculating, but this is speculation at this point, that it might indeed uh, have a beneficial effect simply because um, the uh, bacteria which you isolate from these lesions are um, mostly enterococci or E. coli. And these are actually uh, just ordinary inhabitants of the intestinal tract. So um, if there is, if your tight junction uh, stability is improved and there is uh, less leakage from the intestinal tract, the risk of developing uh, this kind of lesions uh, should be reduced. Thanks. Then there has been several questions concerning butyric acid and resin acids. Uh, are there any advantages of resin acids compared to butyric acids and are, are there any possible synergies? I don't, this is a bit commercial question, but. <laughs> I, I'm just going to stick to the scientific aspects. Um, so, uh, uh, with respect to butyric acid, uh, you know, butyric acid is produced by the uh, Lachnospiraceae and the Ruminococcaceae, which are two families belonging to the Firmicutes, and they are in the Sika. So, butyr in the natural conditions, butyric acid is produced in the Sika in large amounts. You can measure um, uh, rel you know, relatively large amounts in the sequel content, but that is even uh, a balance between the production and the absorption because there are three receptors for butyrate, the GPR41, GPR43, and GPR109A, which efficiently take up the butyrate from the intestinal lumen into the epithelial cells and um, that's where the, the action of the butyric acid is, uh, is taking place. This, this mechanism is, is active in the lower part of the intestinal tract. Essentially, Sika are very important for that. Uh, to some extent, it's also the case in the ileum, but not further up the, intest the small intestine. And so I would like to come back to what Juha uh, clearly presented in his talk, showing that the um, you know, with the enterohepatic cycle, and uh, it's clear that the activity of uh, of the resin acids and of these uh, uh, the, this, this pro product is actually uh, on the small intestine, uh, so further up. Um, so, um, and and the effect is actually on the um, destructive activity of the matrix metalloproteinases at that level, which means that. Um, butyric acid, which the activity of the butyric acid is actually as an energy source for the epithelial cells of the Sika, that's one. The other one is that butyric acid is taken up very actively by the L cells, which are present in the cecal epithelium and in the ileal epithelium mainly. And these L cells, they also have these receptors for butyrates, and they are the producers of the GLP2, the glucagon-like peptide 2, which is secreted in the bloodstream and which stim has a stimulating effect on the growth of the small intestinal villi. So these are 
totally different uh, mechanisms. And, and based on that, um, I would expect that this could be complementary. Also, and, uh, that, you know, I would just like to say that uh, when you add butyric acids in the diet, it's really rapidly taken up, you know, from the intestine. So even if you try to protect butyric acid in, in diet with various means, we have, we have studied many products. You hardly see any any butyric acid in small intestine. It, it has disappeared already before that. So it should be very, very well protected so that it would go through the small intestine or even to small intestine. Okay. Thank you very much for for both of our speakers. And thank uh, thanks for the audience for good questions. I think that we have um, taken our time, reserved time for the for the webinar. So I would just like to give a uh, short summary what we have heard today. Uh, so Professor Dukatel started his presentation by explaining the genetic development of birds uh, selected for feed intake. Uh, which puts the digestive system under big pressure. And that's one of the, the reasons why research and innovations for improved gut health are very important. He also explained uh, the vicious circle of diet junction barrier disruption and the role of uh, MMP enzymes uh, in that and how resin acids can have a role in stopping this circle. Uh, and uh, Juha gave a good reasoning for the mode of action studies, uh, for the needed mode of action studies in addition to performance studies and explained why different approaches for understanding uh, different research approaches approaches are needed for understanding better <clears throat> what's happening inside the gut and what is the effect of uh, feed additives. Uh, and and uh, he also gave examples of uh, of um, results with um, with. Uh, uh, progress uh, in in broilers uh, uh, and the and the, and its mode of action so i think we we heard two excellent presentation and learned a lot today i hope all the audience also enjoyed uh, the webinar thank you very much for all of you thank you Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.